welcome. This conversation, as you're probably all aware, is, uh, is called Deep Adaptation, Deep Transformation, or Both. Targeting a climate resilient, sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to underlying values, worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems, and power relationships. This is from the authors of the IPCC report, uh, unanimously approved by 195 nations. And yet, um, that's not what we read about in the headlines. So this is uh, what, we'll be, what we'll be discussing the implications of this today. Last year, Rupert and Jen co-edited a collection of essays called Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. Thank you, Rupert. And, and he's recently initiated a new project called Transformative Adaptation, uh, designed to accelerate building resilience in response to this sy systemic climate and ecological collapse we're looking at. This is not meant to be a debate between me and Rupert. We're really entering into this live conversation publicly with a shared intention to build a deeper collective understanding of how to respond to this civilizational emergency. Could not be a more important question in, in, my, in my mind. So um, as we go into this now, what I'd like to do is um, maybe turn to you, Rupert, um, asking you if you could just help to get some context setting here. When we're talking about um, the need for this adaptation, we're talking about this dire situation. Could you maybe give us a little bit of a, a clearer picture of how you see this global situation unfolding right now? And why, why do you see it as being dire or whatever you describe it as? Yeah, yeah. So let's start from the IPCC report, Jeremy, which you rightly highlighted, which unfortunately hasn't got quite as much attention as it should have done, given the uh, world geopolitical situation. I'll come on to that in a second. This IPCC report um, is yet again the, uh, the scariest yet. Uh, there's innumerable things in it which are deeply uh, worrying. This report is on uh, adaptation. That's what it's about. It's on adaptation, resilience and vulnerability. So it's incredibly timely for our conversation, uh, let alone for the planet. Um, I was an expert reviewer on the report and so I've been familiar with a lot of what's in it for, for quite a while. And uh, one thing I'd like to highlight, which was highlighted at the, the press conference that launched it, was that it's quite smartly written, this report. The IPCC uh, have gradually been sort of upping their game in terms of becoming a little bit sort of communications savvy. Having said that, and if you've taken in some of the news coverage of the report, I would like to say that even now, um, it's less bad than it used to be, but even now the IPCC reports are slightly off the pace in terms of where the situation really is at. That's partly for no fault of their own. Uh, these reports are always, of course, out of date by the time they come out because they've literally taken years to put together. Um, these reports go through a kind of process of sort of consensus molding and, and they have this thing in them where they say we have high confidence in this, medium confidence in that, low confidence in the other. That can lead people to sort of dismiss or put to one side the low confidence results, mm -hmm. but that's really a mistake. If we're coming at this from a precautionary perspective, some of those kind of outlier possible events, um, some of the consequences of our recklessness um, are actually deserve to be taken extremely uh, seriously. Uh, there's other things I could go into, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. The, the, the brief version is that even now, um, not as much as before, but even now, the IPCC reports should be taken as a sort of baseline, not as a kind of, it, this is as bad as it could get or something. Really, it's like the, the dire things that they're saying, it's about, this is about as good as it can get. Um, and from, as I say, from a precautionary perspective, we should actually have the expectation that things may be worse than some of the uh, worst case scenarios, so-called, in the report, let alone than just if you just only take the things they have high confidence in. Mm -hmm. uh, so my own view is that actually we're considerably more vulnerable even than the impression that's been given by most of the news coverage right. of the IPCC report. 
Uh, and now connecting that with the geopolitical situation, um, basically everything that is important about the Ukraine situation is connected with what we're talking about here today. Um, Ukraine is a major breadbasket of, uh, of Europe. That may be one motivation for Putin's actions. Russia is, of course, a petrostate. Uh, that's where it gets its power uh, from. When you support uh, the gas and the oil industry, you're literally supporting the war on uh, the Ukraine. Uh, and perhaps most crucially of all, um, if, of course, we had properly mitigated and adapted years ago, uh, we would not be now dependent. And by we, I mean, especially us in Europe, but it's also America, too. America is also receiving gas from Russia. We would not be now dependent uh, upon uh, Putin's um, petro power. Um, and that really just underscores the absolute importance uh, this year, right now. Uh, this is a unique moment, uh, a moment we should uh, we should seize. Um, uh, a unique moment to potentially pivot. The, the great importance right now cannot be overstated of moves towards energy efficiency, uh, demand reduction, mm -hmm. uh, things like uh, uh, better house insulation, uh, etc. These are things that can be done pretty quickly, unlike bringing on uh, on line new nuclear or, for that matter, uh, fossil fuel um, uh, power. Uh, and they're things that absolutely must be done if we're to avoid being over a barrel from Putin next winter, mm -hmm. and if we're to get anywhere near the kind of trajectory we need to get on in order to avoid uh, cataclysm. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, cataclysm is to some extent here already, uh, more of it is coming, it could be that a lot more of it is coming, and the IPCC only really scratches the surface. Uh, and that's why... Um, although my diagnosis of the situation is not quite as categorical or um, uh, devastating as my colleague Jen Bendel's, um, uh, that's a key way of understanding why I think we need to have a strong deep adaptation perspective. Um, and let me just explain that very briefly and then I'll go back to you, Jeremy. Um, what I mean by, by a strong deep adaptation perspective is that I'm not in favor of putting all our eggs in the basket of deep adaptation. Um, as you've mentioned, I'm also strongly in favor of transformative adaptation. We'll come on to that uh, in a minute. But what I do strongly believe is that it is no longer rational to believe that there is no chance of uh, societal collapse driven by ecology and climate in societies like ours. And as soon as you think that there is some reasonable chance of such uh, collapse, um, then it seems to me you have to engage in some deep adaptation as uh, an insurance policy. Uh, and that is the way I think that all rational people should now think of deep adaptation uh, as an insurance policy in case of the worst occurring. Whether you think that that worst is certain or likely or merely possible uh, or indeed already underway, um, any of those uh, make it rational to uh, include deep adaptation in your arsenal of responses, in your arsenal of responses. Yeah, 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 thanks Rupert. I follow every aspect of what you're saying. And um, the one thing I, I would add is, um, even though of course the, the focus of attention is on climate because climate is the most extreme and most obvious way in which uh, we have been screwing up our whole um, home that we all live on. We need to recognize climate itself is just a symptom of a deeper underlying uh, crisis that we are engaging in. So that even if there were some magic bullet, which we, we all know in this, in this room here that there's not, but even if there were, we could solve the climate crisis with some sort of new um, fusion energy or, or whatever comes down the pike. All it would do is push the can down a little bit further to a far greater systemic uh, devastation that we're on, which is this ecological collapse we're driving our society into. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're looking at things like in just the, la in the last 50 years alone, 68% of animal populations worldwide have been de de demolished. They, we've lost most of the animal populations worldwide in just that time. Um, and we're looking at um, mainstream economists look at tripling um, the uh, amount of production and consumption that has already caused so much damage over the year between now and 2060. That's the kind of reason why I, I absolutely share with you, Rupert, Jen Bendel, and others the sense that we are headed like at a rapid, rapidly increasing rate towards 
this increased possibility of collapse of our civilization. So it, it, that's where I feel we, we share the context. I think mm -hmm. what, what is a rich place for us to explore in this conversation, what I think people, um, everyone who's aware of these things is grappling with them, themselves is, so how do we respond to this? Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I um, wrote the critiques I did to um, Jim Bendel's original article and, um, the, and the, the kind of deep adaptation movement is not that I disagree with a lot of the diagnosis, but it's there's a sort of subtle distinctions, which I think become very profound in people's minds, which have to do with the sense of one is inevitability versus likely or a real possibility. And that's in itself is a big distinction. You know, we just all been watching, or many of us probably watched that um, Don't Look Up uh, yeah. movie over the holidays, where now if there was an asteroid, like we are seeing in the sky hitting us and we've got nothing to do, that's a time in my mind to deeply adapt, <laughs> to sit there like in, in that, whatever the scene and, and be with your family and just recognize spiritually, be, be open to collapse. I don't feel we're even close to that place right now. And I feel that the ways in which we engage, the tonality in which we engage is what's crucial. But at the same time, what I, um, where I agree so much with Dem and, and you, Rupert, and others, is that there is this kind of hopium that goes around. There's this, this techno-optimism, the sense that we read about, like in progressive um, uh, newspapers like The Guardian or whatever, almost every day, like there's still a chance if we can um, do, look at what we're doing with renewables, look at what we're doing here, and we've got to invest in this stuff. But we need to recognize this, the problems are far more systemic than almost mm -hmm. anybody is looking at, which is why my focus is on the deep transformation, because we it's only by recognizing the depth at which we have to shift society that we do have a possibility, in my view, of changing trajectory. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be willing to look reality in the face uh, and um, our love affair with technology and with science uh, makes it difficult for us to do that. Uh, obviously, in saying that, I'm, I'm not at all saying that uh, that green technologies, etc., are not part of the solution, let alone climate science, which is absolutely vital. But what I am saying is that, that, as you say, Jeremy, if we look to those for our salvation and not to anything deeper, uh, then we are in very, very serious trouble. Uh, and that's one reason why I suspect we are in very, very serious trouble, because as I see it, and I'm partly coming at this as a philosopher with a background in, in Wittgenstein, as I see it, we live in a profoundly scientific uh, society. And that's true even today. There's a kind of very widespread science worship and some of the kind of um, anti-science stuff that you're also seeing uh, in recent years is a sort of reaction, a sort of extremist reaction against that science worship, a stupid reaction. Um, but the science worship is, uh, is not something to be welcomed and it's not surprising that it uh, breeds that kind of reaction in some places. So absolutely, we need to have a, a transformation that is profound. Um, I see some signs of that uh, transformation uh, in, its, uh, in its early or possibly mid stages. Um, as someone who is a student of Joanna Macy, um, I agree with Joanna Macy's um, judgment, however, that that kind of transformation uh, and that what she calls great turning, mm -hmm. um, nowhere near enough of it has happened yet. It's not happening nearly fast enough and it is not gonna happen at a pace to save our current civilization. Uh, in saving that, I don't mean to claim that collapse is inevitable as Jim has, uh, has often uh, claimed. And indeed, one of the reasons I agreed to edit this book with Jim was precisely because we wanted to make clear that um, to be signed up to the deep adaptation agenda, uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to believe that societal collapse um, is uh, inevitable. Uh, but what I do think, and I, I think we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later, what I do think is that it is clear that our current civilizational model is bankrupt. And as you say, we need something which amounts to uh, a paradigm shift. The only way we get to get through this without collapse 
is by such profound transformation that what comes out the other side looks very little like our current civilization. Uh, and that's the reason why I make the claim uh, in the title of uh, another of my books and um, one of my most well-known talks that this civilization mm -hmm. is finished. That's what that claim yeah. uh, means, that, that, that we only get to avoid collapse by transforming in such a way that our civilization is no longer the same civilization in any meaningful uh, in any meaningful sense. Now, if we start to come to the question of, 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 of what you're trying to get at, which is how do we aim at something which is not collapse, um, mm -hmm. which I think is you know, great. Uh, and I do think it's really important that we have something positive to, to aim for. Um, I, my way of, of framing that um, is uh, with this idea of transformative adaptation. Um, which is a concept which has its uh, its pedigree in the United Nations uh, and in academia. Uh, it's developed by the think tank I used to chair called Greenhouse, for example, in our book, Facing Up to Climate Reality. Um, and uh, now I'm trying to, as you kindly mentioned, uh, push it forward more widely. And it's something which I'm hoping is going to be kind of ground up and bottom up and, and widely understood as a, a frame for, for, for what we need going forward. Um, and I'm inclined, so, so what I think is that we need deep adaptation and transformative adaptation. Deep adaptation is like the safety net. Transformative adaptation is what we're trying to do, is what we're positively aiming at. There's a huge, huge overlap between, between transformative adaptation as a kind of spin, if you like, on the kind of thing that the IPCC have been saying this week and trying to radicalize that further. There's a huge overlap between that and what you call deep transformation. But I do have some concerns about the, the deep transformation framing. So I'm just wondering if we should take right. a few minutes to think explicitly yes. about these framing questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so let me put my, my key concerns. So the reason for the conceptualization of deep adaptation, mm -hmm. which, uh, which Jem came up with, is because what we have had to date in the adaptation field, not very much, frankly, but what we've had has been reasonably characterizable as merely defensive, trying to defend our current civilization, mm -hmm. which is never right. uh, defensive, incremental and shallow. And obviously there's an allusion to um, the, the wonderful old philosophy of deep ecology uh, mm -hmm. in, in saying, well, what if we were to have a deep version of adaptation instead? And mm -hmm. the contrast is clear between deep and shallow adaptation. Now, the, the, the framing concern I have about deep transformation is that it's not clear that that kind of, um, that kind of um, parallelism works because it's not clear what it would mean at all to talk about shallow transformation. So can, I, can I put that question over to you? What would shallow transformation be? And, and if it's not clear what it would be, then, what, then why, should, why does it make sense for us to talk about deep transformation? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, and the way, what comes to my mind really um, might be that we can think of, if there is such a thing as a shallow transformation, we can think of that maybe along the lines of um, a transformation within a part of the system that doesn't actually mean a transformation of the entire system. And so um, this actually goes along the lines with um, a model of change that um, some, some people in this group might be familiar with, which is known as the Three Horizons model of, um, model of change, which is a simple idea. If you like, imagine that you're kind of walking along in this un unknown territory um, and the Three Horizons relate to a first horizon, which is like just kind of looking at the steps you're taking right there, making sure you don't trip over. The second horizon is like what you can see at the horizon. And the third horizon is something beyond. And the notion of that is that um, when, when, we, when I'm talking about deep transformation, I'm talking about actually recognizing that we need to move to that third horizon. It's even like far beyond what we're looking at right now. Shallow transformation, if we want to sort of come up with, with that term, is a little bit like that sort of second horizon thinking. And in, in real life, what that refers to is imagine something like, for example, 
Tesla, you know, like um, within the auto industry, it's transformative. Everything's different. It's, it's an, a totally electric vehicle, which does just everything that the old uh, fossil fuel ones did. Exciting. It's, it's a transformation, but it's a paradigm shift, but only within one part of the overall system. What we need to look at is that our absolute, the capitalist system, and let's, I'd like to bring in the, these, this term, this elephant in the room that often just gets ignored because it's, to me, this is what it's about. We live in a system of global capitalism that is based on, fundamentally based on extraction and exploitation. That is the basis of it. And, and it's based on what I look at a lot in my writing. It's just based on this underlying worldview that humans basically are separate from nature, that nature doesn't actually have any intrinsic meaning um, or um, value of its in itself, that it, humans are also separate from each other. And so everything about our life is meant to be to improve our status and wealth at the expense of everything else. When I'm talking about deep transformation, I'm talking about looking at what it would be like to build a civilization on a fundamentally different basis, basis of what is actually life affirming, actually, Imagine a civilization based on setting the conditions for flourishing for all humans on a regenerated earth. That's deep transformation. Um, and that's what we need. And of course, people can say, we don't have time for that. We're already heading towards the precipice. My point is that that is the only way we can actually begin to turn this juggernaut around is by actually shifting the very direction itself, not just kind of making a few incremental steering adjustments so we, the angle with which we hit the collapse is a little bit more oblique. Mm, mm, yeah, okay. So um, the point then would be um, that transformation has to be, yeah, profound, uh, has to be, well, I would say it has to be genuine, really. Um, and that's what we're aiming at then is an ecological civilization. Um, okay, uh, I still think that it, it's a bit unclear wh whether it would really make a lot of sense to talk about shallow transformation, but I do see what you're positively uh, uh, aiming at. And I guess my response to that and why I, I'd still kind of lean towards the transformative adaptation framing rather than deep, deep transformation while recognizing there's a huge amount in common, and basically aiming to do the same thing, is that what I'm very keen to emphasize is that we are well past the point where we can get through what's coming. And in fact, the IPCC report for the first time said this, um, in any kind of smooth or, or serene kind of transitional right. way, yes. there's, gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of pain. There's gonna be, have to be a lot of, of adaptation to our vulnerability, to disasters, uh, et cetera. Um, mm. that, and that adaptation is gonna be, have, have to be ongoing and open-ended because we've introduced um, instabilities into the climate system and indeed, as you say, into the broader uh, system of biodiversity, which are going to last for, for centuries. And it's going to take a yes. long, long time for them to play out, even if as humans we get our act together, which we don't show a great deal of sign of doing uh, so far. So for me, the, the, a virtue of the transformative adaptation framework is that it's a more decisive break with the hopium, which you rightly criticized earlier. And one slight worry I'd have about, about the deep transformation frame is that it might encourage people to think all we have to do is, you know, it's absolutely vast uh, <laughs> thing we have to do, but all we have to do is change our paradigm and then everything's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas my thought is something more, more along the lines of, we are entering into a profound time of testing for humanity. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. This time is gonna be in many ways, horrible and disastrous. There are gonna be uh, more and more disasters for a long time to come. There is gonna be a great deal of pain. There's gonna be a great deal of psycho-spiritual pain. Right. And, and one slight place where we may differ is that while I agree with you that we have to have something positive to aim at, and my, my frame for that is, is the positivity of the transformation that's obviously present in the concept of transformative adaptation. What I also think is that we should be very open and explicit about the fact that we have to reap the benefits, if you will, 
um, of the negativity too. We have mm -hmm. to, uh, we, I think that by really feeling and facing the psycho-spiritual pain, for example, we can potentially potentially grow. And mm -hmm. the, the here again, I'm very much drawing from my teacher, uh, Joanna Macy. I think that uh, when you look at the history of disasters, that there's something very encouraging about that history that often what happens is that people become stronger through facing the survivors, through facing those disasters together and through building new communities uh, in those. So what I would say is that following the great German poet Hölderlin, where the danger is, there lies the, the saving power, that mm -hmm. it may be that our greatest opportunity now um, is to is to reap the painful learnings from uh, from disasters, from our own psycho spiritual sufferings, mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. from facing what we're doing to to other um, animals and so forth on this earth, and that to get the positive, if you will, we may have to go by way of that negative. Mm -hmm. And I think that the the concept of transformative adaptation is helpful in getting us to 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 that point, and might be more helpful than the deep transformation framework. But over to you. What mm -hmm. do you think? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And as, as you're talking, a couple of um, kind of themes come to my mind. So I'd like to touch on one and, and then to the more spiritual aspect of what, you're, um, what you've been touching on, Rupert. The first thing, I guess, is, um, to be honest, one of the biggest um, kind of gut responses, negative response I had to the deep adaptation frame to begin with, is the sense that when oftentimes when we look at ad adaptation, it gets to be very easy to look at our local adaptation and um, begin to kind of close the barriers around us. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. from the, the, the global um, climate justice perspective, probably, yeah, probably the vast majority of people in this meeting room right now are from the global north and are relatively well able to look after ourselves um, uh, up to the point of a total utter collapse of everything to, to do with civilization, which we hope and pray will never actually be experiencing because of the disaster that means. But, in, uh, um, but then people in the global south right now, the majority of the world are actually facing some version of that collapse, either right now or fairly soon. And so a part of what I feel is so important to get it clear and even if we are talking about deep adaptation, is we in the global north, who are the ones who, who are actually reaping the benefits, the material benefits of the destruction that um, has been done historically to the Earth system, we're, we're the ones have an obligation to actually reinvest what we have to the global south to actually help them to adapt. So even then, yes. I see it ab about transformation is about transforming our entire economic global system to actually funnel the funds where they're needed the most for the adaptation that is required. So that's just one global point. And in terms of how I see this coming back to your remarks about uh, adaptation, again, I'm in fundamental uh, sympathy in terms of how I see this playing out in terms of something like transformative uh, adaptation. So adaptation needs to be just uh, one of the big problems with, I was at the, the COP in Glasgow in November, one of the really big problems with the COP process and with the way that the rich countries have tried to play the climate issue is that they have focused so strongly on mitigation, mm -hmm. on, on prevention, which you know, sounds like a great thing. And of course, in, in, in some ways it is, but in other ways it's not. If it occludes the damage, the vulnerability and the requirement for adaptation. And my strong belief is that the reason why adaptation has had such a, such a short straw so far uh, in climate uh, policy and in climate activism until mm -hmm. very recently, um, I think there's two main reasons. The first reason is that when you start talking about adaptation and doing adaptation, then you can no longer avoid facing up to the fact that the crisis is real. Whereas right. actually, if you stay wholly in the in the in the realm of mitigation, if you st if you're talking all the time about net zero 2050 or even net zero 2030, you're still basically kind of implying to yourself and to others it's not quite here yet. Whereas mm -hmm. adaptation is no, it's here, it's right now, and we've got to stop ourselves getting more vulnerable. The second reason I think that adaptation has been a poor relation uh, is because there's such a need, as you said, there's such a need to adequately fund adaptation uh, in poorer countries. But to, to put it very bluntly, rich countries don't want to do that because they don't see any benefit from it. Whereas they do exactly. see benefit, 
from getting poor countries to mitigate because everybody benefits when the atmosphere is not overloaded further with, with CO2. So you see, it's a very, it's a very kind of brutal realization. The reason we've been focusing so much on mitigation is that it benefits us and benefits our children. And of course, that's what we need to be doing is, is taking care of our children and thinking genuinely long term. But if we're not thinking about adaptation and doing adaptation and doing it right, which means doing it justly, as you say, and doing it transformatively, plus a, a side order of deep adaptation. If we're not doing uh, those things, then we are shortchanging right now the people of the global south. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying on that, Rupert. And I want to um, just come back to this, this question that I feel everyone probably sits with in this conversation. Um, about this question of despair and the, the place for that in what we're doing. Um, to me, I do feel it's important, uh, like my own perspective, I'd want to emphasize to everyone in this, in this room, is everyone has got their own path. You know, for some people, it might be like Greta Thunberg or others, it might be a year or more just spent in this place of silence and despair. For other people, it might be a day spent like that. And, and however it is, and, and for, well, speaking for myself, it's not like I go there and then I never go back to it. I'm always teetering I'm right on the edge of what feels like despair. Every time I look at, these, at this situation um, that is actually unfolding and where we're headed, um, yeah. And what I what I feel to me, I try to go. It's almost like a little bit like navigating, sort of skiing down. So like just curving into it enough to get the energy from it, not so much to then get sucked into it. Because um, to me, what it seems to be about is not being attached to outcomes. None of us know what will actually happen. If I had to put odds on it. I would put odds that um, we are headed for some absolute disastrous collapse that maybe some of the elites in the gilded lifeboats might uh, maintain some version of something else. But we're, we're not, it's not looking good. But there is, whatever there is a possibility of, that's what I feel um, is what we have to give ourselves to. It basically, it's like diving into the, the mystery of this recognition we live into these we live in these incredibly complex nonlinear systems. None of us know where, when the next Greta, Greta Thunberg type of person might come, only this time might be somebody from the global south, somebody who then brings hundreds of millions of people um, to, um, to get energized in a way we haven't seen yet. Um, and we can't just rely on any one person. We have to realize that each of us is actually setting the conditions for that kind of person to arise. The, it is a part of human instinct is to follow somebody who gets gives them inspiration or whatever. But it's also, we are actually all co-creating whatever does happen. So that does seem to me to be like, the more I look into the despair, the more I look into the desolation where we're headed for, the more I feel that that is life calling me to say whatever it is that I can do, whatever each of us can do is required. And um, not because I know what's going to happen, but because I know I'm alive right now and I can do this. And if any of those of us who are, are in the place of more privilege, where we have the freedom and power to do that, that's what we're being called on, in my view. Yeah, I, I strongly, strongly uh, agree. I resonate with that profoundly. Just very briefly uh, in response, I would say, we badly need um, scenarios that are not just scenarios of a, a, a non-believable, shiny, tech sci future where we colonize the solar system and everything's fine. Um, and we badly need scenarios for futures which are not just uh, apocalyptic meltdowns and everything's gone. Uh, we need futures that are to be imagined, that we can see, that we can start to try to contribute to, which are in between those. But what I would again stress is that I think there's a balance here. On the one hand, one wants to um, make those futures be um, as attractive as possible, as well as as possible as possible, if you see what I mean. Um, on the other hand, I think we have to be very realistic about the pain that we're going to have to go through to get there. So again, yeah. this is why I say, let's get real about the adaptations that we're going to have to make of all kinds, practical kinds, spiritual kinds, um, etc. Um, let's not shy away from um, the horrors at, at any point, the horrors that are here, the horrors that will be coming. Let's let's instead em embrace them, if, if you understand my meaning, mm -hmm. uh, as the yeah. fuel that we 
speaking about uh, a minute ago. Uh, and let's make sure that when we um, are asked for hope, you know, often I'm asked, you know, can't you give us more hope and so on, that we ask the kind of tough questions that need to be asked around requirements for hope. Hope for what? So is it is mm -hmm. it rational, for example, does it make any sense now to hope for the continuation of our current civilization? No. Um, uh, we've got we've got to always ask hope for what um, we've got to also make sure that we're living in the in the present and that we're not kind of putting all, all our um, all our eggs in the basket of a supposed better future, which may or may not come. I agree with you totally about not being attached to outcomes. Um, and um, finally, I would say um, that while hope has to be um, active, otherwise it isn't really hope at all. It requires action. It can't just be a passive uh, attitude. We also should have a preparedness for failure. This is the complexity of my message. My message is, is less uh, simple than Jen's message and perhaps less simple than your message. I say we have to be willing to do these two things at once and try to combine them. We have to be aiming for a better future and at the same time preparing for the potential of a, a really really difficult future i think we yeah. must do those two things at once otherwise we're likely to be caught short so what i think is that we need deep adaptation and transformative adaptation. Deep adaptation is like the safety net. Transformative adaptation is what we're trying to do, is what we're positively aiming at.